that cut her out. I'm so sorry, but I really didn't want to go into what I am really. Uh, let's just say that um, I come from the the geological sciences, the world of geological sciences, which is nothing but a sort of forensic science. I mean, we're looking at rocks and we're trying to figure out what must have happened years ago, millions of years ago. In fact, for me, overnight means one million years. So <laughs> that way. So um, uh, the topic that I wanted to talk about, okay, it doesn't go back. Yeah, it's about neotectonism in the Eastern Himalayas and the Shillong Plateau Shear Kinematics. It sounds like a whole lot of jargonistic kind of words, but in short, what it really means is uh, that this doesn't work. Okay. What it really means is that the entire Himalayan region, as we all know, uh, was a product of something called plate tectonic theory. Now, this is something which came into force, or rather which was introduced to the world very late in the age. In fact, it was only 1960s when this entire concept of plate tectonic theory came about. Before that, people really did, we were, we were trying to explain things differently. Who knows, maybe 10 years down the line, we'll have some other concept which has come up and plate tectonic theory will kind of go into the archives. But uh, this particular theory, it explained a whole lot of things that happens on this planet. So uh, I'll give you a very, very layman kind of an understanding of this entire theory is that if you take a boiled egg and if you just crush it in your palms, what remains is somewhat what the earth looks like. Okay, so you have a very thin crust, which is broken up into pieces, which are in motion with respect to each other. And then you have the, the white part of the egg, the albumin, which is something like the mantle. And then you have the core of the earth, which is somewhat like the yolk of the egg. And in fact, um, there are people who are doing, you know, who have kind of brought this out into the open. And that is that, you know, the thicknesses, they have the same kind of ratio. So must be something embryonic about this planet. Uh, but uh, to go on with this, so the plate tectonic theory, it states that all the the, the, the plates that you have all over the, the crust of the earth, they're in constant motion to each other. And that's the reason why you have mountains which are being built, you have tsunamis, you have earthquakes, most importantly. We are right now sitting on a plate, a part of a plate, which is tectonically extremely active. We are in zone five, which means you can have earthquakes up to uh, almost eight on the Richter scale. So. I'll quickly move over to the three kinds of movements that you normally have in plates. One is where plates are moving away from each other, so new crust gets formed. Uh, the second is when plates are moving towards each other, so one kind of moves below the other or one moves above the other. And the third is when they're moving past each other. So the first one is constructive, new plate gets made. The second is destructive, old plate gets consumed into the mantle of the earth. And the third, there's nothing, there's no, I mean, it's, it's kind of conservation, earth conservation, let's call it. So I'll quickly go over to the geological map of the Eastern Himalayas. What you'll find, uh, anyway, uh, the map on the left, if you can see, uh, the green part, if you see, it's, it's basically the Eastern part, exactly what we are here for Eastern Himalayan Nationomics Forum. That's exactly the Eastern Himalayan part. So what you see is the Himalayas are moving from Nepal, it goes up, it goes almost northeastwards, and then suddenly it gets truncated. You know, it gets truncated beyond which you don't have the Himalayas anymore. And then you have the, the Burmese uh, mountains which are going down, which is the Arakan Yoma and the Pehu, Pehu Yoma, and the two are not connected. They are basically, they are, they are not connected as in they are not a continuation, they are connected by another hill range which is called the Mishmi Hills which runs exactly northwestward, southeastward. Now this is extremely interesting geologically speaking because this is one part where the Indian plate is juxtaposed in such a way that it has the Himalayas on the northern part and it has the Burmese mountains on the south eastern part. And if I go into how the Himalayas were formed, many of us know that. Uh, I mean, around say 180 million years ago, the Indian subcontinent, 
which is now the Indian subcontinent, broke free from Africa, moved northeastwards, came and hit against the, the, the Asian part of the landmass. And what was formed in between is the Himalayas, what is standing up. In fact, uh, we have this story, a geological uh, understanding or a geological uh, a story behind the formation of the Himalayas, where we say that there must have been a sea between the two, obviously, there must have been a sea, and which was known as the Tethys. And uh, it is actually the, the sediments of the bed of the Tethys, which is actually standing up as the Himalayas today, which is why you find only marine fossils up on the hills. I mean even the highest mountain in the world, you, you have marine fossils. And that's the reason why people started thinking about this entire plate tectonic theory. Now, moving ahead, uh, this is exactly, the, I, I won't go into the nitty gritties of uh, the movement, you know, the, the, the way the movements have happened. So this is what the, uh, the, the Himalayas look like. It starts at Karakoram, which is like, you know, the, the northwestern part out there. And it moves down, and then you have Nepal, and then you move up, and in, you move into the northeastern part. You move right up to uh, Arunachal Pradesh, and then suddenly, poof, the Himalayas just disappear. And then you have this Mishmi Hills, Mishmi Thrust, as it is known as, which connects the Himalayas to the Burmese Hills. So, the other part, which is also interesting, is that while the Indian plate moved towards the northeast and hit against uh, you know, the Eurasian part and formed the Himalayas, in a similar way, in fact, it goes below. You know, it's, it's called subduction. So you have the, the, the Asian plate here, and the Indian plate is moving actually below. Similarly, along the Burmese part, the Burmese plateau, uh, the Burmese plains, you have a similar kind of movement of the Indian plate, which is moving underneath the Burmese plate. So you see, it's, it's, it's like, a, it's like a, a piece of, you know, anything, any kind of matter, which is being stretched from both sides. Because it's also moving in underneath the Himalayas, it's also moving in underneath the Burmese plate. So it's actually being stretched to its maximum Absolutely. So what happens is when you are stretching anything, it's matter uh, at the end of the day, and you have something known as the, the Young's modulus, which means that you know, there is something called the elastic limit, and after which it's going to rupture. And when that happens, we are talking about earth plates. We're talking about the crust, and the crust ruptures. So what happens is whatever was underneath can actually move up. And that is where my work starts. My, I'm, I'm right now I'm doing my, uh, I'm, I'm continuing with my research in, in the Shillong Plateau, where we are trying to map all the, the, the lineaments as we, as we call it, or rather the, the fault zones, which, which literally border the Shillong Plateau. Is almost like, to sound very gross, if you try and press your pimple and try and burst it. It's somewhat like that. So you know that the, the entire crust is getting stretched, so it bursts. And then all the crust moves up. And it's almost like a pop-up phenomenon. It, the older crust just kind of springs up, and that's what Shillong Plateau is all about. Why? Because this entire northeastern area has rocks which are, say, about 30 million years too recent, very recent. like created yesterday, kind of. Whereas Shillong Plateau is almost 1,000 million years old. So why is it that suddenly you have this little part of land which is like a plateau, which is standing above everything else, and it is crisscrossed by faults, and it is of a much, much older age, of a different lithology, rather. I mean, the rock types that you find in Shillong are very, very different. Now, why I am, so we call it the pop-up phenomenon that Shillong Plateau has literally come up because the rest of the Indian plate has been stretched beyond its capacities. So this is the Shillong Plateau that you see. Uh, I, I will move over from here again. So basically, the entire Eastern Himalayan area, or what we know as the Northeastern region of India, is kind of special in a way, uh, as, a geo as a geologist, I would call it special. Firstly, it is geomorphologically very, very intricate. You have mountains, you have rivers, you have 
plateaus, you have everything, you name it, you open a geography textbook, whatever you have, you have textbook examples of all of it in the Northeast. Secondly, you have, uh, it's one of the largest rivers is running through it, the river Brahmaputra. It's the seventh largest river in the world. It's one of the widest, which means the sediment influx, which, is, which it is bringing down, is immense. So it's, it's like Mumbai city. Every day you have one lakh people getting there, looking for a new job. So it's almost like, you know, the Brahmaputra brings in that much of sediment onto the land almost every day. So imagine that amount of load is constantly getting loaded on the crust. So the crust is very, very pressurized. Thirdly is that those are just little snippets that I wanted to add that in the Brahmaputra you have Majuli, which is the largest river island. You also have Umananda, I think, which is called, which is the smallest river island. So you have best of both worlds. And also, we are, which is very, very strange, we are seismic, seismically active, but it is one of the largest, one of the largest oil fields in the world. We also have that. Hydrocarbon fields in seismically, uh, active areas is not very, very common. It's kind of rare, and yet we have it here. So all of this is very, it, it kind of, uh, and most importantly, Shillong Plateau, that area where I'm working upon, is pre-Cambrian, pre-Cambrian pre in age, whereas the rest of the area is tertiary to, um, to recent. So now, how do I, okay, I'm going to skip all of this. This is very, very technical. So, what I really wanted to talk about is that how does this kind of get, how do we kind of bring it down to what we are actually talking about, and that is the rural futures. Now, while I was working, I was working on a very, very structural, geological kind of a, a situation, a, a, a problem. But while doing it, what I realized is that because of the intensive faulting, see any kind of earthquake is basically a result of faulting wherein you have blocks of rock moving past each other in very, very simplistic terms. So because of the faulting, the groundwater reserves in this entire area is getting disturbed. Like for instance, in the entire Himalayas, uh, say about 30 years ago, you had a lot of springs, you know, those waterfalls, natural waterfalls, which would not dry up during the dry season. But in, this re in the recent times, especially in the eastern Himalayas, we have found a lot of drying up of such springs, natural springs. And we feel that, see, the fact that there is a natural spring is because when the groundwater table gets exposed, and that kind of exposing of a groundwater table happens only when there is faulting. We are talking about an area which is seismically very active. You have earthquakes almost on an everyday basis. Even as I speak, maybe there must be a tremor going around which is imperceptible to the human body, but uh, on a seismograph it will come out as a graph. And the fact is that uh, because of so much of seismic activity, the groundwater is constantly getting shifted. So it has a domino effect on everything. It has an effect on the groundwater. So people hitherto who may have had uninterrupted water supply suddenly feels that during one part of the year, the water suddenly goes dry. I mean, in the Northeastern part, water was never really a problem. Contamination or portable quality of the water may have been a pro issue, but no, not having water was never a problem even 30 years ago, but it has now started becoming a problem. So along with Balipara Foundation, we are trying to start this entire project where we will be working with the International Water Security Network, which is based in London, uh, wherein we will try to entirely map this entire area. We'll try and entirely map the aquifer, the, the characterization of the aquifer, aquifers, also um, you know, the groundwater table characteristics, and also contamination. And see, contamination is not necessarily man-derived uh, all the time. I mean, the moment we think contamination, we think of industries, we think of pollutants, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but not necessarily. I mean, even because of Earth movements, you may have one layer of rock which has a lot of, say, arsenic suddenly getting exposed or coming into juxtaposition with your water table. 
And so therefore your entire groundwater gets polluted because of the arsenic and the people get con, uh, affected because of that. So we are trying to do that. We will try to do that. Hopefully by next year, we will have a lot of data to share. Uh, we'll try to do that so that at least this entire area gets mapped. A, the, the, the structural geology part of it, or rather what the subsurface looks like and how it has affected the groundwater. And eventually that groundwater obviously will affect the people in the villages because uh, that's where water sometimes has to be brought from long distances. You know, I'll, I'll share this little anecdote. I was uh, researching, I was working on a project in Rajasthan a few years, uh, about 12 years ago. And uh, I was basically doing structural geology. My structural geology is my, my basic, my, my area of work. So I was working on that and there were these, there was this highway separating two villages. And uh, when I went there, they, you know, the, the village people have very, very simplistic idea of about people who come in and who work. And they, if you, if they see you with one small little gadget, maybe a, a GPS meter or maybe some kind of stuff that I use as a geologist, they think that you're a surveyor. Okay. So they would come up to me and they say that, you know, we have a problem in the village. Can you please uh, solve it for us? So what's the problem? It's just that there is a road and there are two villages separated by the highway. All the wells in one side of the village have water like very high, like the water table is, groundwater table is very high. So the well is full of water. And the other side, there is no water at all. I mean, they've been digging for years and years and years and they're not getting any kind of water. So they gave me the kind of solutions that they have come up with. They have, they had come up with churel ko bhagate hain. There is a churel in the garden, in the village, who's, who's kind of churel as in a witch in the, in the village, who's kind of not letting us uh, extract water from the ground, etc. etc. all these kinds of things, which, which normally these kind of people talk about. And they would go on and on and on until I told them that let's just sit down and try and see what it is all about. And what did we find? That road happened to be a fault. Because of faulting, that entire, the other side of the village had actually gone down. You see, I mean, Geomorphologically, I mean, on the on the on the surface, because of erosion and stuff like that, it all looks the same. But there has been a faulting because of which one area had literally gone down. The one block of the rock had gone down, and therefore the groundwater table was lower in the other side. So you would have to actually dig around twenty meters extra just to strike water. So you see, these are the kind of problems which are now slowly coming up in the Northeast, especially let's talk about the, the, the animal part of it. Water holes are drying up and not filling up with water again. Not necessary that this is climate change. You know, as a geologist, we don't believe in climate change. I mean, I know it sounds pretty blasphemous, but as a geologist, we don't believe in climate change because for us, it's a cyclic thing. One part of the land which has seen an ice age is now hot as hell and will see an ice age again. You get my point? So it's, it's like a cyclic thing for us. So this is a big debate between geoscience geo, uh, workers and non-geological science workers because we are always on loggerheads as to whether climate change is real. You know, I'm so sorry, but that's just our the cohort kind of things like that. So anyway, so what I'm trying to say is that in this entire area, we have probably so many sanctuaries, so many national parks, uh, many of the water holes are drying up. So maybe that kind of geo characterization of the entire hydrogeology of the Eastern Himalayan area will probably help us in the future to come up with solutions for water resources in the villages. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am, for your insightful commentary on the subject. I know. I, uh, Dr. Shorkar, thank you very much. I don't really have a question, but I have a statement to make. Uh, I'm not um, of a scientific mind, so to speak. So this will take a, a little while for me to understand. But you have helped me visualize what Thank you so much. what uh, I can visualize your presentation to a large extent, which will which will help me understand what you were trying to tell us just now. And I hope I get the opportunity to speak to you some more about this because it really uh, I didn't know how much it would um, make sense. It does. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.